Hey, so when the Pharisees asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of them all? Little did he know he was offering up a soft pitch for Jesus to hit out of the park. Think about it. He's basically saying, of everything that's in the Old Testament, what's the most important thing? And Jesus says this, offers up a purpose statement for every single one of us. We exist to love God and to love others, period. Now, I say period because that's all there is. You know, since the year began, we've been talking about God and who he is. We've been talking about his attributes. We've been talking about his love. Last week, we said that his love, like everything else, is holy, which means different. He's called us to be holy. He's called us to be different. How different are you? How peculiar are you? You know, uh, love, rightly understood, is what you're seeing here. Now, some of you know that what you're observing here is a physical force. It's actually called centrifugal force. It's an outward seeking constantly from the center access uh, access all the way out, uh, away from the center. Now, some could say, well, there's a centripetal force as well that's pulling back. It's why the ball's not flying off. The string kind of represents this centripetal force. But love, here it is, is always centrifugal, okay? It always moves outward and away from the center. You know this, if I were to let go of this string, you'll know what happens, right? You know what happens. It's gonna go, it's gone. It flies out because it's always seeking outside of itself. That's the way love is. Today, we're gonna look at Matthew chapter 22. You go ahead and turn in your Bible. I want you to look at God's word today. So right where you are, I've got a message for every person out there. Now, this message is going to help us. It's not only going to warm your hearts today, but it's going to warm the hearts of every person that you know. So grab your Bible and hang on. I'm going to make this real simple today. In fact, I'm going to let Jesus preach the message. We're going to take his two points, which we're going to discover is actually one point, And we're going to talk about what it is to love God and to love our neighbors and our friends. And we've got some real uh, central, easy, applicable ways that we're going to be able to do this. Love is always centrifugal. Now, all the way from the time that we began our series on God, we've been saying that he's calling us to be like him. Again, to be holy means that we are different. We need to live, watch this, questionable lives. We need to live lives in such a way that people question, what are you doing? And that's the way God's love should be for us. That, 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 that he loves us in such a way, we've received his love in such a way that we now love others in the same way. And people go, what is happening here? Are you living a questionable life? Listen to this. It goes on in Matthew 22 and in verse 35 is where we find it. One of them, he's an expert of the law. And he says this, he asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment? Which one of all of them? Now, some have noted this is all of the Old Testament. Like, think about that. Of all the Holy Scriptures, what's the most important thing? What's going on here? Jesus finds himself in the center of a cancel culture. They're trying to cancel him by by different opinions and approaches, trying to reduce his popularity, if you will, catch him, snag him. It says earlier that this Pharisee was meeting in a group. And in fact, with the group of people he gathered with, they come up with a singular question. I've never really caught that before. It says they met together. And then one of them asked this question. And this was a scholar. He's a lawyer. He knows what's up with the law. And he asked him the question, which one's the greatest? So caught in the crossfires, Jesus then answers the question. And here's the thing. This is a great question when you think about it. His motive is, is, uh, is revealed. This guy's motive is not pure, but he's asking the question. The question he's asking is this. What does God require of me? What does he want from everything that he said? What's the one thing that he wants from me? In fact, you could say, what is the purpose of my life? The question he's asking really, whether he knew it or not. What is, why am I on the planet? And so listen, this is for each of us. Why are you and I on the planet? Why are we here today? This message is so significant because in it, Jesus says this. He says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And and you know other 
translations add in other places because it's this is in all the synoptic gospels it adds and all of your strength now you may have heard that broken down really the, G, the jesus the point he's making here is this that you're to love god comprehensively with everything in your life all that you are you're to love god why were you born listen to this to love god that's it to love God and yes, to love others. But this is why we were born. Now, follow me closely here. I want you to hear this. There's only one God, we've said it. Now, as mysterious as this is, this one God uh, comes to us in, in, in three persons, right? We'd call it the Trinity to explain this thing that blows our minds. And yet, think about this. God is a God of love. And so how could he be if he's only the Father How could he love? Love implies relationship, right? And the Trinity, ancient uh, theologians have called it the the divine dance, that that it's always been this dance between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, And God loves the Father. He loves the Son. The Son loves the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Son. And what we see is in the Trinity is this Trinitarian dance of love. Think about it. If he, again, if he was only the father, how could love, okay, listen to this. How could love exist for all eternity before creation without the triune God? You see, it makes perfect sense, the Trinity does, when we consider that God is a God of love. Love has always existed. Before creation, he was a God of love. And so he calls us then to enter into this divine dance where in the Trinity, each person of the Trinity defers the other, adores the other, loves the other, rejoices in the other. And then God invites us long before we were born. This is happening. And then he invites us in. But think about this. This is the very heart of the creator. The creator then creates out of love. Have you ever thought about that? He didn't create because, well, you know, he thought it'd be cool or because he's all powerful and he wants to show his power or because he was curious. He created out of love. God is love. The very essence of God is that he's an outward seeking, outward, right? Uh, Outward focused, sacrificial, loving, giving God. So out of the very center of who he is, he creates You see, deep, true love is always like that, isn't it? In fact, if I were to tell you that we have a a loving church, if I were to say that to you, uh, you would say, well, then I I bet I feel welcome there. If if I were to say, no, we're we're loving and we, we love all people, you would know then, okay, if you're watching me here online, if you're a guest ever to come, we hope you'll come see us in person when we're back together and come next week and come see us, you would expect, well, I'll be welcome there. Because it's a loving church. And, and it's because love is like that, right? And this is the church that we are. All people are welcome here. All inclusion of all people because God loves all people and he loves through us. God's love is always bubbling up. It's always spilling over. It's always flooding the banks. Creation is like that itself. It, is this overflow. The result of God's love expressed through all that he's done. And then he creates us in his image to join this communal dance, which cannot be contained. Now, this may sound bold, but if you don't love like that, if you don't love other people, if you don't have this this outward expression, this outward seeking love in your heart, the Bible says you don't belong to God. You don't know him. You may talk like you do, think like you do, or, or, or you know, hope that you do, but if you don't love The Bible says that you don't belong to God. Think about it in 1 John 4. He says this, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves is born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. His very essence is love and he creates us. So my point is this, of all creation, the outgrowth of his love is poured into each of us as he's created us in his image. This is why you and I are are, are made with an indescribable, indescribable worth. 
because God has created us in this way. You know, when I was little, um, I, I remember being told that, you know, a woman and a man, uh, they love each other to a point. Mom and dad loved each other to a certain level uh, that they had a baby. And that's how it goes down. So I, I thought, okay, so, so dad loved mom to a certain level, to a certain point. They loved each other so much, bam, mom got pregnant. And, and I remember thinking as a kid, um, that's exactly how it goes down. And children, listen, uh, parents, that's exactly how it happens. That's exactly what happens. So parents, y'all can sort that out later on. But I remember thinking, love produces babies. That's how I got here. Mom and dad loved each other. But listen, here's the point. This is precisely the image that we see in creation. God creates all things out of love. And even a husband and wife, you see, their love for each other overflows and creation of a family is possible. Uh, or an adoption of children into this loving relationship. This is why, again, you're a person of infinite worth because God has created you out of love. Even if you think, well, I, I was the product of a loveless um, you know, conception or, or, or you, listen, you are a person of indescribable worth because God has created you out of love for what purpose? To love others. That's why Jesus says then, this is the great and first commandment there in verse 38. Here's, here's the point. This is your purpose. This is your purpose. You know, all of us want to have a purpose statement. We want our own branding. We want to do our thing. Here's what I'm about. Um, let me get creative about how I express my, you know, my purpose in life. Listen, this is your purpose. Love God and love others. This is why we're here. And then Jesus says this. He says the second is like it, a part of it. That's another way to say equal to it. Okay, so the two are inseparable. And he says this, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, anyone would love, how you want to be loved is how you're to love your neighbor. And he says, on these two commandments, all right, depend all the law and prophets. Everything hangs on these two. They're inseparable. Think about it. This, this, this for a moment, I want, you to, I want you to consider this. The Pharisee is spot on in regard to his, uh, his orthodoxy. I mean, in fact, in the Mark account, he says, he tells Jesus, imagine this, you're right. That's exactly, you got the answer right. Because what's happening here, though it seems revolutionary, and it is, we're going to see this in a moment. Jesus is actually quoting uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4. It's the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He's called you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's revolutionary is Jesus then says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Because as we'll see today, loving God is loving God others. That's, that's how we do this thing. The second command is, is like the first. In fact, it's one because this one separates those who, who would say that they're truly obedient from those who are not. Loving God means that we love our neighbor, right? Now, Francis Schaeffer, in a generation ago, he said this, in the absence of a biblical morality, a new elite will always come forward to dictate arbitrary absolutes to society. Now, now here's my point. What we're seeing in our day is kind of the flip side of this, where we have this, you know, we've placed the Bible on the shelf. We have no absolute truth, really, in our culture anymore. We live in a, many are saying, a post-truth culture, which is a post-Christian culture. And, and so what we find then, people are just saying, whatever goes, anything goes because there's no Moral, absolute. There's no truth, really, that you can run to. When we live in a society like that, what happens is we want to correct people. We want to speak the truth, but we've got to do it in love. Let us not become like the Pharisees who, who were strong on ethics and morality, you know, being right. But they were weak on real love and real relationships in their lives. See, if you desire to be right, I say this often, if your desire to be right outweighs your desire uh, to love others, then you're doing it wrong. You might be a Pharisee. And that's what Jesus is teaching us here. Let's have truth and grace that guides our lives. Jesus shows us that love actually defines the lawful life. Now, don't miss this. He, he shows us that the law actually defines what it is to love. I think so often in our lives, we, we tend to separate 
uh, the law from grace. We say, well, we got the New Testament, you got the Old Testament. Jesus actually shows us here that loving God is how we fulfill the law. Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. Okay, so what he's saying here is this. The law, when he says the law boils down to love God and neighbor, he's saying we have, we have not fulfilled the law simply by avoiding what the law prohibits. Instead, we are to be and to do all that the law is going after, namely, love. So God is calling us to be a people of love, and it is love in action, is what Jesus says. I mean, think about it. You can say, well, love God. Well, God is spirit. Uh, how do we love God? By loving others. Here it is. We love God by loving others. That's the whole point that Jesus is making here. His singular summary of the law is exceedingly powerful and disturbing because it takes the questioner here from the arena of achievement, right? Which, you know, he might conceivably had fulfilled, but not with his attitude. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart where nobody can boast fulfillment. No one has ever loved his neighbor perfectly. No one has ever loved God perfectly. And so God calls us. Jesus is saying here, the purpose of life is to love God. How? By loving others. Are you living that way? Are you a loving person? Are you constantly living a centrifugal, others-seeking, others-focused life? This is your purpose in life. This is why you and I were born. And I want to I share something I found fascinating that I discovered this week. I'd heard about this, but in light of what we're talking about here, uh, I, I, I learned that each of us are hardwired to, to love others. And when we offer acts of kindness and generosity to other people, it actually makes us feel good and it makes them feel good. Now you might say, well, of course, Jeff, you discovered that this week. When somebody does something good for you, it makes you feel good. But did you know that there is inside your body uh, this chemical, some of you know this, it's a chemical called oxytocin. Now, Simon Sinek talks about this from a biological perspective, how kindness and acts of generosity produce this chemical of oxytocin in, in each one of us. Oxytocin is responsible for all the warm and fuzzy feelings, the, you know, of unicorns and rainbows and puppies. But it actually, every time there's human connection, it's the, it's the human uh, connection hormone. And every time we offer an act of kindness, it boosts uh, the, the oxytocin levels in our body. And not only that, but when you offer a kind a word or loving act towards another person, it creates in them an increase of oxytocin. But watch this. Research shows that when you watch someone do a kind act or, or act of generosity and love towards another person, it creates oxytocin in you. And so I started to think about this. I, I didn't know that huge amounts of oxytocin are produced in a, in a woman's body when she gives birth to a baby creates that mother-child bond that lasts really for life. But in the, in, the main, in the main way that oxytocin is produced in us is through acts of love. I think it's God's way of, of, of saying, listen, I want y'all to just look after each other. I want you to love each other. That's why you've been created. How cool is it that the very purpose that God gives us to be alive, to love him and to love others, actually creates joy in our bodies, in our lives. I think that's why a lot of us have gone through a very difficult time uh, this year. You know, when, when we've been away from each other, I know it's been hard for me. Another way that uh, oxytocin is produced in the body is through physical touch. And, and yet we've been, we've been separated. And, and, and so this week, I experienced this. I was sitting in my office. It was uh, in the morning. I was kind of having a funky day. And I, you know, and I'm a pretty optimistic guy, but I was like, ah, not a great day. I've, I've, I think I'm still feeling a little isolated from people I love. It's cold. And what I discovered was this, watch this. I decided I'm going to make some phone calls. And they were people I wanted to call. I've been wanting to call for a while. I called a gal in our church whose husband was on a ventilator in the hospital because of COVID-19. Now, praise God, he's off the ventilator now. But I was able to call her. And you know what happens? 
I'm encouraging her. She encourages me. We're praying together, and we know that God is in the midst of that. And then I made another call to a member who has recently been diagnosed with a uh, particular disease. I made another call to a woman who uh, really is struggling right now. And then I called a staff member to say, way to go on a particular ministry assignment that had been accomplished. And I uh, just celebrated. So I get off the phone. And, and it wasn't until later in the day. I went on with other things, meeting or something. And then it wasn't until later that I realized I had a major shift in my day. And then I was reading about this and I thought, oh, there you go. It's oxytocin. Now, you might say, well, Jeff, something more spiritual than oxytocin is going on. It's more than just chemicals in your body. And certainly that is the case. That God's created us to love. But my point is this. Doing what he's called us to do has not only spiritual, but emotional, physiological, and mental benefits for all of us. Let me ask you, do you want a happy marriage? Then love your spouse unconditionally. Well, Jeff, you know, sometimes that's hard. It's hard to do that, but when you do, you're going to create some oxytocin in your spouse and even in you. You want to live a life of joy and celebrate his love for us every day? Love others without condition. It'll happen. See, we say it oftentimes uh, here, you know, marriage, the purpose of marriage is not, it's not happiness. It's holiness. It's that we're going to be different than other people. But here's what happens. When we love differently, when our love is holy, when it's separate, when it's peculiar, when it's, when it's weird, when we love like Jesus unconditionally, it creates happiness in us. This is the way to the joyful life. This is true if you're single, if you're young or old. The pathway to joy is to live a life of love. Now, on this Valentine's Day, on this day of love, we're launching an entire uh, season of love for our church family. I'm so excited to bring this news to you today that we are going to walk through a season, the Easter season, the Lenten season together, and we're going to be able to bless others around us. When I heard about this, I was reading about oxytocin this week, I, I thought, okay, here's what I want. I want my family. I want my staff, our church. I want our church family to be an oxytocin factory. That's what I want to see. Because every time we come together, let love reign and rule so that joy and the love of Jesus surrounds all of us. Because we've been created to love God and love each other. And so we're calling you to be a blessing. You know, we say it often. Uh, I said at the beginning of this year, we are called to bless others because we've been blessed to be a blessing. And so for the next uh, 40 days coming up, you're going to be able to learn um, 40 days. We're going to go through missional, missional practices where we're going, to, we're going to be able to love our neighbors. You're going to hear more about this, but you're going to grab one of these. It's online as well. We're going to have five missional practices where we can love others around us for 40 days. I'm believing, friends, listen to this. I'm believing this is going to change your life. If you apply this, if you do this daily, and if, and if we do, we're going to be able to bless others in our lives. This week, we're going to be praying for four people in our lives. And yes, beyond that, but we're going to pray that God will lead us to people we can love uh, in his name and be like Jesus. In fact, what we're going to do here during this season, we're called into the flow of God's love for us. Think about it. You go all the way back to the garden. God creates out of love. He creates man to love and to love him. But Adam needed another. He creates Eve. The two of them love each other. They, ha they have children. Ultimately, through Seth's line, he, he blesses the world. Then Noah comes along, right? Blesses the world. Abraham, in Genesis 12, offers the blessing to the, the, the people of Israel. Then Israel is going to bless the nations. And that comes true when Jesus finally, through the Davidic line, is born and comes into the world to bless the world, the whole wide world. And now he's called us to be agents of blessing in the world as well. You and I are blessed by God as children of God, sons and daughters of the beloved King, to bless everybody else around us. And you can do this. You know, one of my great joys of being your pastor is that I get to serve five generations. What demographers and, and social scientists uh, note, five, even six, with some from the greatest generation, if you're close to 100 years old. And we have some members who are close to 100 years old. Six generations. Here's what I know is true about each one. Every generation has been created by God 
to love him and to love others. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter the color of your skin. If you're, if you're male or female, it does not matter. Leslie Newbigin, who is one of my favorite missiologists, theologians, he said this, we must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. Friends, we need to live questionable lives. I want us to live in such a way that people wonder, why are you loving me like this? Why are you listening to me? Why did you ask me to go to coffee with you? Why did you call me? I'm asking you, friends, will you join us? Will you join us? These five missional practices are easy to follow. What we're going to do, we're going to begin with prayer. We're going to pray for people in our lives because that's where the Spirit moves and He starts to move in us. We're going to listen to others. We need more people listening to others. Even listening, I've discovered, is an act of grace. And people go, this, you're, you're like locked in. Why are you so interested in what I've got to say right now? You're interested in my life. It draws people to the love of God in us. We're going to bless people by beginning with prayer, listening to them. The e- We're going to eat with them as we can. We're going to have coffee with them. We're going to share our lives with them and learn more and listen more. We're just going to love people. That's how easy this is. And then the S, first, we're going to share our story. We're going to share what Christ has done for us. As we've earned the right to be heard and loved well, they love us in an act of love overflowing from us. We're going to talk about what Jesus has done in our lives. We're going to share the big story. So we're going to begin with prayer. We're going to listen. We're going to eat. We're going to share our story. And in that the story of God, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And throughout these weeks ahead, we're going to walk through each of those steps to learn and to practice together what God is doing. I'm believing stories of love and blessing are going to burst forth out of our lives as never before. I'm so excited about this season. But know this, it's not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy because it's hard to love like God loves us but we can enter into this together. One writer noted this, he said this, learning to love like this requires a lifetime of training in which we are given the opportunity day by day to have our self-centeredness discovered and overwhelmed. That's another way of saying to let God's love for us, going back to the gospel over and over again, to to overcome, to dominate, to push out uh, all that is in me, Let his great love capture my heart and change me. So here's what the Bible says. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, in this, this is love. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins, to be the wrath satisfier for our sin. Friends, we constantly go back to the gospel. So unlike the Pharisee, we constantly go back to what Christ has done for us as the driving motivator to love God in response to what he's done for us. And we do this by loving others. That's the proof. And it all starts with us giving our hearts to Christ right now. So if you don't know the Lord, if you've never given your heart to him, I wanna challenge you to do this. He's calling you into this dance, this Trinitarian dance, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for you to come into this dance and live your life to abide in Him. And listen, don't let anybody cut into this dance, even yourself. You live a life with Him daily so that you can then live this centrifugal force of love out of you into the world. And as the days come, we're gonna be able to love others together and share stories of how He has changed our lives. Because Christ alone has lived this perfect life. He alone has loved God, the Father, the Spirit perfectly. He alone has loved others sacrificially, selflessly, by dying on the cross for you and for me so that we could know him, we could be forgiven and then love others. That's what we're gonna do this week. So I want us to pray together as we close. And then commit our hearts and our lives together as a church family, united in love, to go forth to change our world by loving others like Christ has loved us. Let's pray together as we close this time now. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. 
I thank you that you love us so much on this day. We're reminded of how much you love us, that all of creation came out of your heart of love and you created us in your image to love you and to love others. And friend, right now, with your head bowed and eye closed, right, right where you are, with your eyes closed, I want to ask you, do you know Christ? Have you received his love? Because that's why you have been created, to be loved by him, And then for him to capture your heart, to change your heart so that you can love others. He died on the cross for you. He gave his life for you so that you would receive his punishment for your sin and be forgiven and live forgiven. Lord, we give this time to you. We give this entire Easter season to you. And I pray that we would never be the same. And as a result, all of our relationships in our lives will forever change. And we will bless those in our lives and we'll see hundreds and hundreds of people come to know you because of our simple love and the way that you've changed our lives as we share it with them. Lord, use these 40 days, this coming year, this decade and years to come, all for your glory as we seek to love you and love others. May this be the purpose of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.